Thank you very much, Mikhail Tsofati, for your words, uh, warm words. I think it's very interesting and it's very important to continue our cooperation. And now I will give the floor to Professor Nicola Lablanca to chair the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. It's a pleasure to be here. I have been invited. Uh, you, can, you can remain here. Just uh, um, I have been invited to this conference by the organizer. I have been invited to uh, give a few words about the work by Professor Maurice Romani that is very well known to all of you, I, I hope. But in any case, uh, I will say a few words and I will rob 10, 11 minutes of your time before giving Professor Romani the floor. I began with a quotation from his work. I quote, for most among the Jews of that colony, that is Libya, mother tongue is Arabic. They dress jalabia and fetz like their neighbors, and they live in the same miserable houses. But for a minority of them, born in, European, in, Euro in Europe and living in Tripoli, the Jews and the Arabs are dis distinguishable only because the Hebrew women are not veiled face. Those, end of quotation. Quoting a document of December 1945, Professor Maris Romani told us very important things almost 10 years ago in his The Jews of Libya book, translated into Italian only last year. Today, in my opinion, is an important day for Italian studies on Italian colonialism in Libya and beyond. Unilateral partisans of religious, ethnic, political identities are brought back to the complexity of history. It is a great honor, a great honor for me to chair chairing this session and giving the floor to Professor Romani. At an international level, his work is very well known and he is internationally appreciated by scholars. Some of his articles taken from his very extensive literature have also been translated into Italian. Unfortunately, his extensive research and his expertise on the history of Libyan Jews, but as a military historian, I cannot forget his studies on ethnicity, integration, and the military too, are lesser known in Italy. And too often, for the history of Libyan Jews, the only reference still is in literature, in books, the old book by Renzo de Felice, as if after him there would not have been other major international studies. For making us listening to Professor Romani's speech, we have to thank the Documentation Center at, at, of North African Jewry during World War II at the Benz V Institute with Haim Sadun and the Fondazione Centro di Documentazione Ebraica Contemporanea with Liliana Picciotto and Michele Salfatti. Beyond, of course, the World Organization of Libyan Jews and the University of Roma Tre that, that is hosting us. Thank you all. Professor Romani's work told the quotation, tragic period of an old and stable and prosperous community, taken from your words, that was being Libya for centuries. That community, because of reasons related to colonialism and post-colonialism, I guess the colonization, was removed in its entirety from the country where it lived in, and where its women, women were distinguished from the others only for dressing or not, the veil. Here in Libya, the final solution of the Jewish problem was not realized, was realized not by the Nazis, but in two very different stages or steps, a colonial one and a decolonization one. It was a really tragic story, although there was not the annihilation of all the, their lives. The contribution by Professor Romani does not exhaust the subject of our conference, devoted to a wider and more diverse problem, the fate of the Jews in the Italian colonial empire during the Second World War. About the Jews of Tianjin, which ceased to be an Italian colony in 1937, some first publications are available. But Romani's contribution will be fundamental today and tomorrow 
because it has been devoted to a point basic for our conference, the fate of the Libyan Jews, which he studied in his book from 1938 up to 1977. Was the Jewish community in Libya a community united, modern, consistent with other Jewish communities of the Mediterranean and with the other ones in the other Italian colonies? Romani wrote that it, I quote again, remained linked to past tradition and customs, some of which were even borrowed from the Arab population and had little to do with Judaism and even less with the modern Italian one. End of quotation. And his, blue, his book explains very well, along with their successes, the divisions, the surprise, the difficult arrival of the first Zionist militants into Libya. Romani's research is particularly important because it gathers definitive information without any hesitation about the anti-Semitic features of Italian colonial fascism in Libya since the 20s and then during the 30s, 30s even under Italo Balbo. And from the map to deportation of Jews in the fire of World War II. Romani is very calm. He wakes his judgments. He also collects the victims' memory of the deportees to Jado, who, until the end in some cases, hold responsible for their own deportation the Germans, who, who, who would have given orders to the Italians. This is, in my opinion, once more a not infrequent case of the blindness on the side of the victims who face difficulties, often impossibility, to write history. But the quiet listing of the many measures of persecution of rights, as Michele Sarfati called them, a stage to which too often in Nazi fascist regimes the persecution of the lives followed, this listing removes any excuse to Italian history of fascism in Libya, a history to which, especially about Balbo, Renzo de Felice had seemed rather lenient. And it's not by chance that, while taking advantage of the archival sources of De Felice, Professor Romani quotes and refers more often to Mayor Michaelis than to De Felice. And I saw his smiling. In Romani's pages, we find evidence of the diversity in behavior of the Italians. But there is not the myth of good Italian, buon italiano, or italiano brava gente fascist or colonial he may be. In the other Italian colonies, Jewish stories were different, as different were the stories of the colonies and of the Jewish communities down there. But it should never be forgotten that in those years, the colonial Italian one was a fascist rule. Attempts to save Jews' lives, lives from the side of Italian fascist authorities did not lack. But we would well, we should always wonder whether those were intended to save the rights of the Jews or to save Italian authorities. Italian authorities on rights from the pervasive meddling from the Nazis. That is, if they wanted to save Jews' lives or the Italian dignity of an occupying colonial and fascist state. Sometimes, as in the case of Dalmatia, testimonies and scholars made some confusion about that. Yet, at least 20 years ago, Nicolas Dumanis already warned us not to believe to the memories of the Dodecanese Island's inhabitants who spoke about the good Italian. Did they, spoke? Did they speak about that? But, Dumanis explained, they were never, the Italians were never judged to be good in themselves, but compared compared to the Turks who impaled, to the Nazis who deported, to the British that did not relieve them as expected, and to the Greeks who did not fully engage themselves for the freedom of the Dukanese inhabitants. Dumanis' warning have been proven beyond any ideological perseverance in the defense of good Italian, have been proven by younger researchers who have recently, recently gained access to the wide and intact Italian archives remained in those islands, which Dumanis did not or 
because he could not study at that time. Eventually, as historian of Italian colonialism, we cannot ignore or forget also that anti-Semitic racism was, in Italian colonies, accompanied, accompanied when together with anti-native, anti-Africans racism. Please, remember that the fascist anti-Semitic law of 1938 was preceded by one year by an anti-native racist law of 1937. And the first article of 1938 law was somehow copied from the 1937 anti-African law. Of course, I know, we know, the diversity of the two racisms, the colonial one and the anti-Semitic one. But I do hope that the conference will explain to us how one racism influenced the other one. For all these, these reasons, it is actually a great honor. It will be very useful for Italian studies listening to our keynote speaker. Maris Romani is, however, a voice that we could hear some years ago when, together with Professor Leonardo Paggi, who had entered in this field of study but then moving away from it, we carried on some researches that should be mentioned here. On 28 January 2004, it is more than 12 years ago, in these same rooms, if I'm not wrong, a scholarly conference met on the concentration camp in the history of the 20th century, whose second session was dedicated to the Libyan Jews in the Holocaust and the history of Italy. Sometimes later in Civitella Valdichiana, a small uh, village in, in Tuscany, a small exhibition was organized about these issues, Mostra sui campi di concentramento nella provincia di Arezzo. And two years later in Siena, an international conference was held on colonial camps in the history of concentration camps. 20, 21 October 2008. In the same year, the book by Eric Salerno, Uccideteli Tutti, I will tell the, 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 the English translation of the title, Kill Them All, Libya 1943, Jew in Fascist Concentration of Giado, an Italian story, came out. I would say that not all of these authors and scholars have been in agreement on everything among each other. But two common points seemed existing, and they were important. First, that the history of Italian, uh, oh, sorry, the history of Libyan Jews was especially important. And point two, that this story could not be understood without also knowing the history of Italian colonialism in Libya in general, and not only since 1938, then since 1911-12, and from 19. To, uh, 19 uh, um, 28 to 1931, for example. Thus, even inside the largest appreciation among historians, it is legitimate to, to debate. And I have the impression that the history of Libyan and Mediterranean Jews cannot be understood if we examine it only starting from 1938 or in the context of 1942 and Jadon or in the subsequent pogroms of 1945, 1948, and 1967. Furthermore, precisely because Jews have been present in Libya for centuries, it is mainly important to understand not only their identity, but also the cleavage that cross the community. A community is never without cleavages, division, different opinions, different behaviors. No identity is totalizing. Every man and every woman belong to multiple identities. Each community is crossed by economic, political, social, cultural, gender cleavages that cannot be sacrificed on the altar of any identity, including the religion's one. And the community of Jews of Libya cannot make exception, at least at the eyes of historia. Including 1938 and 1967 is even more necessary in order to know how men and women, classes, groups among Libyan Jews acted upon arrival of the Italians on 1911-1912, how they lined up during the demolition of the liberal policy of Statuti and the entry into the cabinet in Rome by the fascists, it is 
1922. What they did while the Arabic population of Tripoli, 1921-1924, and especially that one of Cyrenaica, 1928-1933, were beaten by fascist violence. In particular, I think it is important to understand what the Jews did in 1928-1933, while the Arabs from the Cyrenaic and Jebel were deported to concentration camps, where many died in order to understand pogrom, pogroms of 1977. If we say that 1938 and 1977, 67, sorry, cannot be explained only thanks to 1938, and that you need to see them in, per in the perspective of 1911, 1917, 1921, 1928, 1933, we remind you is not in order to justify what happened. Violence, extermination, expulsion of entire communities from the place where the Libyan Jews had been living for centuries do not admit any justification. It was barbarism. But those lands had seen several other barbarism that the historian cannot ignore. The removal, or as in Europe, the annihilation of historic minorities is a tragedy, not only for the sufferers, but for the whole society. Over time, it is quite possible that within the boundaries of a state, who is in the majority now will become the minority tomorrow. But this should not happen by violence or oppression because sooner or later they will become harbinger or heralds of future violence and oppression. In theory, there should not need for two states between a minority and a majority. But if in an interim phase they are necessary, it is important that this be done in peace and democracy. The, the destruction or denial of the rights of a minority which sooner or later could become the majority, is always a barbarism. Furthermore, identities are always multiple, and respecting the rights of all, democracy could avoid that has under fascism, fascism and Nazism, in different ways, relations between men and women, between majorities and minorities, would be dictated by violence. Democracy never perfect and always imperfect, is a slow and difficult conquest to be uh, guaranteed day by day, as you rightly said, never guaranteed, while identities are always built and deconstructed increasingly over time. As for me, I learned it again. Also, please let me say, super also supervising the doctoral research by some younger scholars. One of them is present in this room, Martino Pizzi, who studied the history of the Jewish Legon community in French Tunisia before, during, and after fascism. And Chiara Renzo, who is not here because she's just writing her dissertation, who studies the transit through Italy of international Jews on their way to Palestine and the state of Israel in 1945-1951. As scholars, we learn a lot from our younger colleagues. And it is a pleasure to see so many of them in this conference. I do hope that the Documentation Center of North African Jewry during the First World War at the Ben Zvi Institute and the Fondazione Centro di Documentazione Ebraica Contemporanea may help them, this younger uh, new generation, in their next steps of research. Our future knowledge depends upon these younger energies. I'm concluding. Studying for years, the fascist barbarism accomplished against a community that had been living in Libya for centuries, in a country where, I quote again, the Jews and the Arabs are distinguishable only because Hebrew women are not veiled face. I know that the question is more complex, but it's very nice, the document of December 1945. We, all together, hold a huge and not only historiographical lesson, learn thanks to Professor Romani's invaluable research. Thank you. So after robbing your time, it's a pleasure uh, for me to give the floor to Professor Romani for his uh, keynote speech.
Professor La Blanca, members of the Presidium, Professor Chaim Sadon, Professor David Megnaji, and last but not least, Professor La Blanca. Colleagues and friends, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by saying that it is truly an honor and a pleasure to have been chosen as a keynote speaker to this workshop. My thanks go to Professor Chaim Sadon and to the Ben Zvi Committee for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate that we have an outstanding representation of North African scholars here with us at this workshop. We know that the success of our efforts hinges on our inspiring others to follow in your, our footsteps. As I was preparing for this talk, I stumbled across a story that underscores the exclusion of North African Jews from the Holocaust experience. Years ago, in the late 80s, a group of Moroccan Jews was attending a service at an Ashkenazi synagogue in an absorption center for new immigrants. At one point, the beadle, the shamash, turned to the group and politely asked them to leave the synagogue for a few minutes, saying, you understand, we plan to recite Kaddish in memory of the six million Jews, and those do not really concern you, have nothing to do with you. End of quote. While this story highlights the exclusion in the early 50s of Middle Eastern and North African Jews from the national Weltanschauung of Israel, today, 60 years later, such a story will have no place in Israel. The, br this brings me to the subject of my talk tonight. From missing link to mainstream discussion, North African Jews and the Holocaust. In addition, I may want to add at the conclusion of my talk, the new phenomenon of deniers of the Holocaust. This is due to our organization. One needs to state from the outset that the final solution was engineered in Europe and aimed primarily at European Jews. Only afterwards, the final solution was extended to North African Jewry where the Axis powers and the Allied forces clashed between Morocco and El Alamein. Therefore, European Jews, the overwhelming majority, Ashkenazi Jews, were the ones subjected to the most horrifying plan of extermination and genocide of the Nazi regime. I want to remind ourselves that the Van C Conference held in 1942, Reinhard Heydrich, who was working directly under Himmler, produced a list with number of the European Jews in each country. It soon became clear that the list included also the Jews from the colonies. For example, under the title France and Occupied Territory, Heydrich listed 700,000 Jews. At the time, France had only 300,000 Jews on its European soil. The balance of 400,000 Jews were living in French North Africa, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Libya was included only after Mussolini signed the Pact of Steel with Hitler in May 1939. Soon after, Mussolini enacted his own racial manifesto, which resulted in deportation, persecution, and internment of Jews in different camps in Libya, Tunisia, and in Europe. So under the final solution, no Jews were to escape the Nazis' extermination machine wherever the Jews were found. Had the war turned around and the Axis powers emerged victorious, the Nazi plan may have been carried out elsewhere in the Mediterranean or wherever Jews were found, including Palestine. Here I refrain from entering the episode of Hajj Amin al-Husseini and his proposed collaboration with Hitler for promoting the final solution in favor of the Arabs in Palestine. However, as you can gather from what I have tried to illustrate so far, that in terms of sheer numbers, one cannot compare the tragedy that befell European Jewry to that of North Africa, although at the time it was not sure that it would turn out differently. 
Surely there was no crematoria in North Africa, as there was in Europe, but there was forced labor, detention, and concentration camp, starvation, diseases, which resulted in many cases in death and suffering that traumatized the whole generation and their descendants for decades later. So beyond this simple arithmetic, Jews in North Africa, in the Italian and French colonies, could have met similar destiny to their brethren in Europe, as was proven by Walter Rauf's mission. So the question that begs itself, why these communities of North Africa and the Middle East, who became the only reservoir for the existential preservation and development of the newly established state of Israel, have been marginalized and their history excluded from the national memory of the new state? The answer to this question is complex and not devoid of culprits who ignored the claims of North African Jews at the time of negotiating the German reparations in the early 50s. Among those was Nahum Goldman, who when leaders of North African Jews asked for their share in the reparation, he retorted by saying, quote, are you trying to hop in our bandwagon? End of quote, so to speak. In other words, to take advantage of this opportunity and get a share of these reparations? The marginality of this group infiltrated also the educational system. The history book that was used until recently by students who sat for the Bagrut certificate had 400 pages, but only nine of those were devoted to the long history and heritage of North African Jews. I ask, is it a prejudice or ignorance that blinded the leaders of the new state from delving into the history and suffering of those Jews under fascism and Nazism? Or is it the heavy weight of the European tragedy that did not leave any room to deal with others? Or is it the generation of the desert, as so to speak, whose main concern was to support their families and to adjust to their new status in the new country that had neither the luxury of time nor the professional tools to tell their story? In 1981, when I founded the J.R. Eliasar Center for the Study of Sephardi and Oriental Jews at Ben Gurion University, I proposed that the first project will deal with, quote, the Holocaust experience of Sephardi and Oriental Jews, end of quote. The project, quote again, had an immediate goal to broaden our understanding of the Holocaust as a historical crisis that also threatened and victimized Sephardi and Oriental Jews. It's intended to, incre intended to incre increase the identification of all Jews with the Holocaust, which was generally being interpreted and presented as involving European Jewry alone." End of quote. The project outlined a future plan that included research and publication of series of monographs, setting up of a specialized archive including taped interviews, preparation of a core syllabus, and pedagogical aids and last preparation of permanent exhibit. In 1983, I turned to few universities in Israel to search for scholars, teachers, who deal with the Holocaust and Jews in North Africa. Only Barilan University answered that they did not know of any. However, it was not only universities in Israel that had nothing to offer on the subject. At the time, also Yad Vashem Museum, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., which I was there at the inauguration, and the Shoah Museum at Battery Park in New York had very little information about Sfaradim in general. As a last resort, I decided to face this challenge and take the issue into my hands by convening a conference in 2002 on the effects of the Shoah on North African Jews and the Balkans. One of the lectures at the conference was Professor Chaim Saldon, whose work on North African communities has enriched many of us. Since that date, and over the past 16 years, not only scholars from Israel, but also from Europe and the United States enlightened us with new material on North African Jews derived from archives on different continents. Scholars in international conference produced numerous publications and developed oral history. Their research is now adopted by the educational system in Israel and textbooks are being rewritten and updated. However, the job, the job is not completed. 
In fact, my hope and prayer is that we are not too late. The generation of survivors will not last much longer. I welcome the progress of the oral history field that has been going on for the past 20 years. This is a priceless information that can always complement the findings of archival do documents and enrich our knowledge for generations to come. And this brings me to the final topic, which I will briefly review now and would like to share with you. This is of the Holocaust denial, which concerns us all, Jews and non-Jews alike. Lately, the ADL published a survey reported in the Atlantic magazine in May 2014. It seems that, that only 54% of the world population has heard of the Holocaust. Some said they thought the number of people who died has been exaggerated. Others believe it's a myth. Other respondents said it is probably true that quote, Jews still talk too much about what happened to them in the Holocaust, end of quote. The largest percentage of doubters came from the Middle East and North Africa, where only 8% were reported to have heard of the Holocaust or believed it is accurate. When the data is sliced by religious groups, people younger than 65 were much more likely to say that facts about the Holocaust have been distorted and less likely to know what the Holocaust is. The survey claims that, quote, although the prevalence of Holocaust ignorance and denial was just one small aspect of the survey, it illuminated a power fact, a powerful fact. As the memory of the genocide grows fainter, attitude attitudes towards Jews and Israel are changing. You might ask, how? Well, let us look of the arguments used by the Holocaust deniers. First one, lack of systematic policy by the Nazis show that it failed to demonstrate genocidal intent. Second, Hitler was not involved. His, sub his subordinates thought that this is what he really wanted. Third, exaggerated death tolls, because it was impossible during the war to keep accurate figures. Four, war propaganda, stories of death camps, gas chambers, crematoria, crematoria and corpses were fabricated or exaggerated by allied soldiers. Fifth, flawed evident claim that existing evidence of the Holocaust has been fabricated or altered. Documents have been forged. And last, the holo hoax, the Holocaust hoax. The most radical claim is that the Holocaust is a myth. You can understand now how important is the weight of oral testimony from camp survivors and relatives as some of you here have used for their research. Allied commanders who liberated the camps in 1945 had the foresight to collect as much evidence as they could. US General Dwight D. Eisenhower was reported to have personally inspected several concentration camps and sent for additional photographs and cinema, cinema photographers to document what remained. When asked, why? Why are you doing this? He said, quote, because the day will come when some son of a bitch will say this never happened. My message today is that we must explicitly factor these topics in our thinking and our course of action. These examples underscore the importance of our gathering these two days of workshop. It is vital that we sustain and nourish these subjects can ensure that they remain rewarding and inspiring fields of historical endeavor and education. To conclude my remarks this evening, let me say that I know I'm asking a lot from you. I'm asking from all of us to do more than to respond to the change that occurred in this field, but to exercise leadership that will put the Holocaust field of European and North African Jews our priority by creating new opportunities Will this happen? I don't know. But I can tell you, 
It will not happen unless we continue with vigor to expand our research, involving other scholars from different institutions to shoulder our responsibility for the sake preserving this chapter of history for future generations. Your papers today and tomorrow are a shining example of the right direction in which the research is going and which eventually will bridge the gap between the obvious and the overlooked. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. Your speech has touched upon several very important points. I will mention just a few, a couple of them. You told your work, Elias' work, the work also of a new generation, in starting from the 50s, probably the 60s. And another point that impressed me is your stressing of the new challenges of new denials that, in my opinion, only research and dissemination of good research could fight. But I think that the floor now is, uh, is now to all of you, if you have some questions, remarks, comments, uh, and so on, on this beautiful speech. Even speaking of an African and Mediterranean. Ah, yes. Comment. I owe this keynote as fear, uh, speech to Professor Sadon. He insisted that I should give a keynote as address. It's not my experience to give keynote addresses. I'm just a researcher, okay? But this time he insisted, so I said, I will not reject your insistence. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Omani, but you know that you are married to do this. And I think this was a wonderful uh, uh, talk and a very good, a very good uh, lecture to try to explain the whole situation or, or the whole perspective or, or the perceptions of the uh, situation of the, uh, the Holocaust denial and what happened in North Africa, what happened in the Israeli society regarding the questions of how can we remember or can we deal with what happened in the Holocaust uh, uh, in, North, in North Africa during the Holocaust and how to, in, to put in all, all of this to the uh, educational system in Israel uh, during those days. And I think that uh, as far as I know that the changes in Israel today are very strong. So that means that people that are still alive from this period of time want to talk about the subject. Their grandchildren, their grandchildren want to talk about the subject. They are trying to find ways how to do it, how, how to learn about the, the subject. Sometimes they are coming and saying, oh, look, we, we never heard about this. But it was written. It was written at the 18. Yes, it was written at your books, at Michel Abid Bulbo uh, uh, books. But they didn't come to, to, to understand that something happened. And now from the, 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 the situation of just I uh, ignoring the, the what happened in North Africa during this period and the situation now that they want to recognize and to want to, uh, to be more involved in the remembrance of this, uh, 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 in what happened in North Africa during period. this period, I think that we have a very great change in the Israeli society and we are trying to understand better than what happened. I think that what we are trying to do in our center at the Bensley Institute is to give to the public the opportunity to learn about what happened. And we are trying today, because of the enormous material that was open at many archives, mainly in uh, France and United States and, and, and uh, Great Britain, we want to give them the opportunity to see the uh, new material that was not open in the 18th and it's open now and to see what we can learn from this. What we heard today from the a diary of uh, Nuno Weiss and what we know from all the diaries, what the, but the people, the ordinary people felt during this period, I think it's very important. And I think that your contribution the, this evening to open the, the discussion about the, the subject is very important. We still have time because the taxi will come to take us at seven o'clock only. So we have to time to discuss about the subject if we may, Professor Magnacci and Professor LaBlanca, 
So we can stay a little and speak about the subject. We want to put all the seminar inside the uh, internet so people could uh, listen, could uh, know more. Yeah, I think now it's so okay. Thanks very much. So I think that I would like to pick up on this last uh, topic, last issue that we can define as post-memory. I mean, we know that there are lots of literature and scholarship about the ideas of post-memory of the Holocaust, but just to link with um, Nicola Labanca's introduction uh, regarding also memory of Italian racism in a wider sense, um, I think I think that we are about to enter in a uh, period of post-memory also of that wider sense of Italian racism. And I think that a very interesting phenomenon that we are observing now is this shift towards fictionalization of historical account and the enormous amount of um, mm, memory narratives that are produced uh, also drawing from historical document but very much in terms of rewriting of recreating memory. So I was wondering if you, as historians, um, wha what is your position about this new memory and this new material that is generated? How do you think to engage with these materials and with these new forms of circulation of memory and history and culture? So if you can give us some of your views on how an historian should engage with such materials. I would like to gather some more questions if they are Even speaking about uh, an African country in the, the Mediterranean Sea, the ice is strong. <laughs> well, please, Professor Roman, you can give your. I have to confess. Um, I was very hesitant about testimonies and oral history for some time. Why? Because I don't think the field has developed enough sufficient scientific methodology. You might ask what could be the methodology? Well, we have parts of this methodology, namely that any oral history or any testimonies, and we know from humans, although the research on the brain is still only at its beginning, okay? And they really, there is a big effort. Uh, I read recently that they are trying to do much more on that. But the mind uh, sometimes deceives or sometimes, I think uh, uh, the speakers here have related to it uh, in the first session and even now, there is something about mythology. I think uh, uh, Professor Shitrit mentioned about how the people can, uh, from nostalgia, develop or evolve, maybe unknowingly, certain histories that its truth may be questioned. Okay. Hence, I take the oral history and my sister has engaged in that, okay? Um, take oral history, not alone, but supplemented, but supplemented solidly or confronted with documents, with other historians, what they wrote about the subject, um, about the suffering and so forth. Um, I remember this conference that we had in 2002 in Ben-Gurion. It was Professor Chaim Sadon said, you know, just, just take it easy. I mean, you know, there was Holocaust. But, but, you know, I wonder if you could call it Holocaust. 
you know, come on, we have a different concept. So concepts have to be precise, have to be, oral history is not that precise, and therefore, for example, if I were to take a Tripolitanian that, a Jew that had lived in one uh, uh, street, and I find another Tripolitanian family that lived next to him in the same street, and in a different street, I wonder what kind of, of memories they would have. And those need to be cross-references. Otherwise, we have problems for future research and generations, I'm saying, not, not because of us, that intentionally we did not try to delve. And therefore, as I think if could be developed any rigorous methodology, really, not quantitative, but qualitative, that could address this issue, how you take that, and if you did not have the historical background, and I dare to say humbly, if you were not born in that country, okay, I wonder if you can perceive, understand the nuances in the language that these people have expressed in giving you their memories. Let alone the language itself. You know, this, yeah, you know, these things are vernacular, but boy, do they say a lot. You know how, that's why I think the Libyan Jewish community, especially in Rome, especially this is the job of uh, Professor Magnaggi, to bring, to build a new generation of researchers that speak the language, that live among their parents, not that you are excluded. That, that, I mean, actually, you are much more important because you see it from a different angle and therefore this could be cross-referenced. Then we really have, we could say, we have real, real what happened, if we can say real what happened. Thank you very much indeed, Professor McNair. Oh, thank you. I've, I think it's important to introduce inside historical research the concept of clima, the clima, the weather. It is an aspect of our research as a psychologist, as a clinical psychologist, but I think it is important to introduce this concept in historical approach because when I listen and I saw something about the diary written uh, by Nunes Weiss, it was important for me to know the perception of Nunes Weiss in that time, the words in Italian that he used. He didn't write in Arabic, he wrote in Italian. And so, what does it mean? What did it mean? The use of some terms and not other terms, the perception of the population, this is very important for the oral history. Oral history was not used by the first, the first researchers on Holocaust the study. I, I, I can say in Hilberg, you don't find anything about witness. He used just the Nazi document for his research. So we have a long time of transformation. In year 60, after the Eichmann process, it was introduced a new situation where the witness became very important. And we are in an era of witness. But witness is a part. You have to be involved in historical research, you have to know the languages, you have to know the historical and the economical and different aspects, and you can introduce also memory inside to understand better. Also, the change of memory is very important. I grow in Tripoli. The memory of the persecution of the fascist rule was not, uh, the perception was not so clear for many people. The memory of the British rule, the memory of the pogrom of 45, was, most, was more important for the people. So it was a, a different perception. 
But we know what it happened in, in Libya, in Chirenaica, in Benghazi. The perception was completely different. So this is very important to know the clima of the perception. This is part of our research as historian. I think it is important for the historians to know the perception of the people, just the cognitive perception, the emotional perception, and the splitting inside the memory. In, uh, in the memory of the Jews of Libya, you have a great splitting, a big split between Chirenaica and the Tripolitan, different completely. And the memory of Chirenaica was uh, removed, repressed. People know, but in the same time, don't know. I remember my father spoken about uh, Benghazi for a long time with my mother when I was a child. And it was important for me today to compare the perception of my father. My father all the time spoke about Benghazi, about Jado. I grew with this memory. I was not from Benghazi. But in my family, the tragedy of Jado was present. But the perception in the collective, in our collectivity was completely different. Completely different. So, how to, uh, to confront ourselves with memory? Memory involved anthropology, clinical psychology, psychoanalysis, and the history. It is not so easy, and sociology. It is not easy. It is a very, a very hard uh, challenge. And I am afraid that today, with collection and collection and collection of witness, sometimes people are managing without the capacity. And you have also different aspects. When uh, uh, in the United States began to collect uh, memory or uh, history in Italy, I, I helped. I helped in the formation of the interviewers because it was also a, a very important problem to discuss with someone who suffered a trauma. So also that, it is not so simple. So also you have different implications. And you have to, to have to be aware about witness that you gave one time, two times, three times, four times, the same people is speaking in different situations for many years, and you have a different elaboration. So uh, I think it is part uh, of, our, of our work, and uh, if we could create an interdisciplinary group composed by historians and uh, sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists. It would be, and the linguist people who are aware about different languages. I, I, I use it just a, a joke. It, it is not a joke. I listened that in 86. In New York, two women, after 20 years or 40 years, perhaps 40 years, they met together. One said, Is a surprise I'm in Chile. Did you see John? Sono veramente Farhana. Four languages Hebrew, Italian, Arabic. English, if you studied Kabbalah, you can understand. There are different sefirot. In each word, you have a sefirah. You have a part of the process of emancipation. And I think that uh, my friend Romani, who know Kabbalah, when he said about the necessity to entered inside the language, inside, inside the memory to understand, 
he wanted to say also something like that. Thank you. I have a problem. This is a personal sharing with you and experience apropos what David has said here. I have a problem in the synagogue. What's the problem? The pronunciation of Hebrew. Pronunciation of Hebrew. How to pronounce the I mean, the Hebrew language in Israel by the young generation is warped according to my standard. It's not Libyan standard, it, it, it is Libyan standard, but we were brought up, the language is the most important. I mean, apropos this, the, the Ibn Gvirol, 1,000 years ago, that he wrote the Azharot, this poem, amazing, at the age of 16. Ibn Gvirol was age 16 when he wrote the Azharot for the holiday of Shavuot. The words there, when I read them, is not the same as my son reads them. I mean, it's the same words he reads. But the impact of that language, of that poetry, on me is different than his. Because in the Talmud Torah, in Benghazi, we grew up that the language as pointed out by psychologists. It, it has an impact on, if you wish, on your psyche, okay? Now go and question a guy or a lady and say, you know, what was really 1938? What happened to you and so forth? It depends on you, if you are on, your, on his same, uh, same wave, wavelength. Are you transmitting on the same wavelength? And that only nuances you can get. And therefore, I agree fully. Interdisciplinary is the most important in channeling and getting near exact information that we want to. And here Ben Tzvi is doing fantastic work, fantastic work about collecting. But it is very difficult inside universities because in, un in the universities, all people, all the people agree if they are listening to you. But no one is doing that. No one, because if you are publishing an article in an interdisciplinary review a journal, it is not so clear that it will be accepted by the different sects, because I call them that, like that. They are sects. They are working like, like the national state. You are not psychologist, you are not historian, you are not anything, you are all the things. You are as a Jew. You are in between. So it is a, 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 a very big problem for us because all the people, all the researchers are aware if they are clever. They are aware that you are right. But in the same time, we have many problems inside academia. I now promoted an international journal, interdisciplinary journal, and I know that I am not able to help my students. I am not able to help them well for their career, for the career, for the career, for the uh, progress inside academia. So it is a very difficult problem. We have to confront ourselves with that. Yes, I'm sure we are facing, or trying to face these uh, difficulties. And who, in my opinion, do better than us are the younger researchers who are, when they are the best, educated in a plural languages communities, they know English sometimes as first language in Italy, not <laughs> Italian, because they hear English music or Anglo phone music. Uh, they see the films not underlined, uh, then, sorry, not uh, translated as in, Ita in Italy we are accustomed to, but they see in uh, original languages. And uh, these banalities tell, told me that, I mean, we have to listen to our younger colleagues uh, to 
move from this very large and very theoretical point about interdisciplinarity and so on, right to the our focus of our conference that I see, and that, that you can see, uh, Italy and Italian Jews in colonial territories and during World War II, because it's that, it's down there that we have to go and increase our knowledge. And I'm sure that after big books like Professor Romani's one, younger researchers, and who knows, the, fa the next book by Professor Romani could, <laughs> could, could add something to what already know. I, if there are other questions and comments, I would not skip the question by, uh, by Barbara to, to my, but I will be very, very brief uh, in the sense that, of course, memory is very important, but, but please uh, remember all of us that in the archives there are tons and tons of papers that are waiting for us, and sometimes they remain there without having been uh, uh, browsed and so memory and paper is my uh, suggestion and if I can say something about the oral history uh, I do not practice well I practice like in a couple of research not on in this field in the past but here in Italy uh, I am not a nationalist uh, you probably understood this but here in Italy we have very uh, international acclaim the scholars in this field for instance Alessandro Portelli is a uh, uh, Roma, Rome board, or he, he worked in, in Roma, is one of the most acute and uh, uh, appreciated, uh, um, if I can say, theorists of methodology of oral history. So as Italians, uh, we are in a good position to practice, uh, uh, to practice uh, uh, oral history. And uh, contemporary history has the good sort, or the maledizione, uh, to go together with uh, oral history, in the sense that contemporary historians are not like Roman history, uh, history of Roman past, of Greek past, of, of the ancient classics, but they go together with uh, the, 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 the testimonies the, and sometimes the victims. But contemporary history could be done even without memory. Of course, and uh, another point I would like to stress uh, that about memory that we not, be not be we we should be very careful because sometimes because we love that because we are studying that we saw some parts of memory and we think that they are as Halbwax told us collective memory that are general memories, that are national memories. Unfortunately, sometimes the, those memories are very sectorialized, are very uh, just in that corner, and they are not, absolutely not, national or collective. So this one point, in, in some case, for, his, for example, I studied a bit, I mean, history of Italian colonialism, but I, can, I, I should say that there is not memory, national memory of colonialism. We have oblivion of our uh, colonial history. Uh, yes, you are very clever and nice, Barbara, when you underlined the, the, the new wave of fictionalism uh, in the field of colonial history, of Italian uh, remembrance, of Italian memory of the colonial past. We saw in recent years more than one, uh, a few uh, writers who wrote novels about that past. Some of them has been very well ac um, accepted by the main publishing house, uh, some of the main publishing houses here in Italy. But even if some of these novels, these cases of fictionalism, surely uh, sell more books than our uh, historians, uh, uh, history books, I, I wonder if they uh, make national memory. As you uh, rightly told, they rewrite history and they rewrite uh, uh, memory. They rewrite images, perceived and uh, 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 
diffused images. Some memories are family memories and are not, nat are not national memories. That's, that's a problem for us, of course. But just to, uh, to briefly, very briefly reply to your comment, I saw one hand, please. Apologize for my English, sorry. Um, uh, okay, but um, okay. My name is Amos Guetta, and I normally connect the memory by picture and uh, video. And uh, my question is uh, is exactly regarding my work. Uh, if the memory we have to pass it to the young generation, so I think that we need to improve our method to deliver the, met the memory to the young generation. Because our method of study uh, is uh, a little not comprehensible, not uh, understandable <laughs> uh, from the, I can speak Arab better maybe. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, because the young people, if you see all the web, uh, you understand that the situation is totally changed. They need small messages. They need a small impulse. I didn't see any cartoons speak about memory, for example, for child, for babies. I didn't see small short film for memories that speak slow, uh, uh, exactly, but uh, fast to the to the to the young people. So I think that the university have to check uh, herself uh, to develop a new method to deliver the, me the memory as uh, photography, video, small talks, and uh, the word that have to make all the work is not only to write book, but to give appeal appeal, exact the word, is appeal to the youngs that want to study to introduce themselves to the memory. And uh, I do film and the picture and I see, also if without word I arrive to the people and I explain something to them. And I think that the university can do more than me, <laughs> because have uh, the, the material, have the material and the opportunity and the, the, the force, I think. So maybe we have to uh, change method of dissemination. That's your point. But we have to dissemination study. Our point is studying Italy and Italian Jews in colonial territories. <laughs> that, that's our point. Are there some comments, uh, questions? You have the opportunity to have Professor Roman here. But if I understand well, you would like to chat with him at around the table at dinner and not <laughs> here in the conference. Yes, sir. It's a very, very good point you made. Very good point because we see it at the universities. And forgive me here, professors and students here. Students do not read. When I give my syllabus, even in the, especially in the United States, you know? They need to be spoon-fed. And spoon-fed in what way? Brief, like you said. Give me the message. By the way, in parentheses, since you are one of the founders of Mafroom, why the Mafroom messages are so long? Because I turn them off myself, you know, after a while. So tell them to be brief. But you are absolutely right. Short messages. And of course, you know, to have the whole content of something important in short messages, you need an art form to do that. You know, giving big speech, you know, for an hour, you know, like this lecturer came and so on, and he then he turned to his host and said, how long do I have? He said, uh, you can have as much time as you want, but remember, we are in 20 minutes, we are leaving, you know. I mean, your absolute videos, oh, no doubt, no doubt about that. Uh, as you said, small talk, and that's what they appeal to, to the young. 
By the way, I don't know if you consciously or subconsciously, you have referred to Moses. In Pirkei Avod, it says, Moshe kibel Torah misinai. Moses received the Torah misinai. Um sarali and he delivered it, or he gave it to Joshua. And the rabbis asked, how did he give it? How? The method of passing to our generation, I've been talking about this in our Libyan uh, uh, organization in, in Israel every time I appear there. I said, what do you give to you? How do you transmit our heritage? How do you transmit the heritage? I'm not talking about how you transmit faith, you know, emunah, belief in something. But I'm talking about your heritage. Besides the mufroom, the kusks, the bastil, the sfins, besides that, you know, how do you transmit these things in this day and age when you have competition? Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and whatnot. And I think I, I, so I think I think uh, uh, Professor McNaughty addressed that interdisciplinary that we have. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor Van Huge, the Dutch guy. You know, he, he wrote once. He said, "What's the difference between Western scholarship and Eastern scholarship?" Western is particularly that is not uh, 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 the eye has to be examined, but the pupil of the eye in order to do this. But the East is is more what the West calls its living time. They know little things about many things instead of knowing one thing very deep. Okay, and this is a big difference. And we are getting back to that East to know more things in order to cover a few fields. I saw the hand by um, my friend, uh, Michele Salfatti. Tunisia, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think maybe Professor Bigdaj would like to address the, the issue between Tripoli and Benghazi, yeah? I, yes, I, I think tomorrow I will, in my paper, so I will present some considerations about that because I think that the Jewish Libyan community is very specific, very different from uh, Algeria, Tunis, and Morocco, and so I will present some uh, observations about that. But let me just add one thing. You see, the Italian attempt, the, the colonizers wanted to see the Libyan Jews as Italians, as they are used to see the Italians living in Italy, assimilated, more Italians than Jews, than Jewish, okay? And not most of the Jews in Libya did not accept that, okay? And therefore, that's how Zionism got its upper hand as a solution to modernizing the Jewish community that the Italians so insistently wanted and pushed for, whether it's Balbo, Badoglio, and others, okay? Um, the, the Italian Jews in Libya, from what I understand, they were really separ a separate group from the indigenous Libyans, if you wish, okay? But I think I leave it up to Professor McDaddy. Just a word. Uh, in a, a letter of Balbo, you can find this uh, consideration. He said, Dobbiamo, è importante snahumizzare l'ebraismo libico. Snahumizzare. And Nahum was the president of the Jewish Tripolitan community. So the implication of this. Uh, quotation, it is very important because for himself, 
the differences inside the community was not so large and also if the community was different, different science, different uh, class position and economical uh, condition, but the unity of the community was very hard. And so it is interesting that he used this word, and Nahum was very European. He was Italian. He was killed in Libya in years about 60, I remember he was killed. Um, uh, and he was also uh, in, I think, in 21 during the po pogrom. It was not a pogrom, but the Italians, the fascists, went uh, to the attack the, the Jewish quarter, and he okay. suffered for that. Yeah. I know some uh, some uh, some histories, and are interesting. But it is interesting that the bridge between Italy. In Jewish community was Nahum, but in the words of Balbo, noi dobbiamo snahumizzare la comunità. So it is interesting. The implication, I can send you the letters. It is interesting. And if I may, if I make a comment on a paper that I will not be able to hear because tomorrow I cannot <laughs> be here, but I look forward of reading your paper because for a long time Balbo has been depicted in Italian historiography as the defender of the Jews. And on the contrary, we see that uh, Italian fascist uh, authorities had very different uh, uh, behavior, probably not al aligned, aligned uh, among uh, all of them, but in any case, in any case, uh, what uh, you uh, now mentioned is incredibly important. Uh, from the historiographical point of view and could make a difference with uh, our recent past. Uh, thank you. I have now some cadeau, uh, Doron in Hebrew. <laughs> to Professor Chetrit, we received this, this CD of the University of Haifa, and you have a, a very interesting work. And so, so I introduced your activity to our colleagues this evening. Thank you for your work, Professor Chetrit. Thank you very much. <laughs> this session uh, ends here, if I understand well. It has been, uh, it has, it began with memory and ends with uh, memory in some sense uh, and uh, history was in the middle and I am sure that tomorrow we'll have more, you will have more and more history and new researchers and uh, thank you very much indeed. Kaddish in memory of the six million Jews.